Hello everybody. So, we have a work of art for the record today. This is a French armoire, part of the series on that very topic here on the channel. Some of the most impressive pieces in furniture history ever made. And this one is emblematic of, it is from the port city of Nantes, dating to the late 17th century here, right around the year 1690. Now this is referred to as an armoire de boiserie, boiserie meaning the wood paneling, as the doors here would have matched the wood paneling of the room for which this was made. It's a very special type of armoire, and we notice that it is very much equivalent to, if not issued from the same workshop, as several which are published in a key text written by one of the ex-directors of the French Ministry of Culture's National Furniture Reserve, Mobilier National. So that is why this one is relevant for us to take a real close look at here, because it can be used, as we see in the book, as a benchmark example. And part of the goal here in terms of understanding these pieces, decorating with them today, is in looking past the impressive size of pretty much all armoires into the details of true artistic value that are only present in a select few. And the best way to go about doing that is to, well, familiarize oneself with the iconic models of armoires emblematic of the different regions at different times throughout France. And as usual, we will be focusing on pieces here that date from that traditional timeline in the decorative arts when furniture was most artistically produced. And this has very, very little to do with antiques, as most antiques were made after that timeline. And anyway, I sound like a broken record, but let's just take a look at what we see here with this beautiful patina, which is typical of 17th century furniture. And we see underneath that patina, the typical undulations left by the hand tools of the maker as he was sculpting out these various parts. But one of the things that startles us is that this is not in mahogany. Most port furniture, say from the port city of Nantes or, or Bordeaux perhaps, most port furniture is renowned and prized for being in this unusual tropical red wood, mahogany, which would of course arrive into France via the ports. Now this particular piece, interestingly, is in walnut simply because it predates the widespread importation of mahogany into France. So even though it's not in mahogany, in a way it's interesting because it predates what we normally think of, the normal period of the golden age of port furniture, but we do see one of the other qualities of port furniture present here despite the use of walnut, and that is sort of the startling sophistication and success of this piece, considering that it is a non-Parisian, technically provincial, work of decorative art. And now the reason why we see such uncanny decor, overall completeness and sophistication on port pieces is because the port makers were more talented in general than their inland counterparts. Because they lived in a port, they had access to new ideas. Anyway, that is our curatorial thinking around why these port pieces tend to stand out among all types of provincial work. This one represents Nantes. It is outstanding to begin with, and then interestingly, it's a very early piece of port furniture that predates the mahogany for which most port furniture is even thought of and remembered. So, with that rabbit hole covered, let's just go burrow down into an even deeper one here and discuss the decor, as we clearly have eight-pointed stars, sometimes referred to as Maltese crosses, yet the Order of Malta probably wasn't active in Nantes. There were plenty other orders of the French King Louis XIV at the time that used the eight-pointed star as their emblem, and it ended up being kind of a widespread symbol on nice pieces of decorative art anyway. So, we see the tenets of 17th century furniture design here with the rectilinear sides here, which are decorated with these nice sort of rectangular coffers, panels. They are also bordered with a smaller molding here that just transitions between this part and the recession. That's a nice little added touch of detail. And then we see the apparent doweling on the side, which is typical of pre-industrial furniture. Many of us, by the time we've reached a piece like this, we're very much aware of that. But for those new to antiques or furniture that's interesting and old, you definitely want to see apparent doweling on the pieces. Otherwise, it's glued together and it's bullshit. But anyway, obviously on a piece like this, there's apparent doweling, hallelujah. And then we come around to the front and we notice that we have a flat classical cornice, which is in a way more tethered to 16th century furniture design. Um, but here we are on the onset of the 18th century. It's still being used in Nantes, uh, in Brittany. 
And the cornice has a little bit of a gap here as it is buckled. It's 330 years old, so, you know, obviously there's a gap up there. Someone mentioned that when they were buying it, and I thought, of course there's a gap. It's old. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I just dismissed the client's concerns and insulted them, and they didn't buy the piece. But whatever, I am not here to stroke your ego. I'm here to, I'm here to represent uh, relevant works of decorative art. But, so, architectural cornice, consoles, frieze of dentals, Typical 17th century furniture design going on here with this rectilinearity. We don't really see that curvilinearity of the 18th century yet, but we do seem to see that announced here in the form of the upper part of this panel, which is itself curved. It's, it's announcing that 18th century curvilinear style, which will soon overtake the entire architecture of, of the pieces of furniture. Now, while we're up here, we better just take a look at two of the most exceptional emblems here, which are these sort of acanthus plumes that are deploying up here at the top of the doors, which roll around and which do not appear to be broken, which is really fantastic. They do not appear broken and re-glued. I love that. The other very successful feature of this piece is at the bottom of the armoire, where unlike the published ones, on this we seem to have two claw feet Two feet of mythological griffins, I'm going to say, the shins of which are protected by, are formed by, scallop shells, it appears. And then around to the side, we see that they sort of terminate, swoop backwards with this wonderfully irregular scroll, typical of pre-industrial handmade furniture. We don't see too much regularity upon close inspection of the sculpted elements. And while we're down here, why don't we just take this opportunity to really fixate on this little missing chunk of the molding here? That'll help us to avoid appreciating the beauty of this entire forest. Okay, I know, I need to get it fixed. Now, inside the piece is really more than charming. But first, we need to take a look at these typically Nantes, typical of Nantes, these Kias cushions in the form of a flame. Flickering up, flickering down. We see two beautiful examples here. Seems to have had a little bit of felt added behind this one at some point. Uh, it appears to retain its original key. And um, anyway, at least this is the key that the people I got this piece from told me had always been with it in their lifetime, but the piece itself had been in their family since it was made for 300 years. They married into the family that had it since it was made or something. Anyway, sad story. They had to sell the house, but they were lovely people, and they were happy that somebody as obsessive as me ended up with the damn thing. So, now, if we see inside the piece, we, we, we notice right away the costume department of Myers and Monroe, where we have a smattering of different uh, suits here that, uh, you know, keep me from wearing the same old shirt in every one of these videos. Importantly, though, this piece actually retains its original shelving. It is really cool, especially when a couple of them are stamped with these bizarre little inventory stamps, 10V here in this lovely late 17th century French calligraphy, which just takes you way back in time to look at the way those, those numbers and letters are written. And we'll see different symbols in this type of calligraphy stamped onto various parts of the piece the back of it, and this was just the inventory system of the maker. Uh, but anyway, I wanted you all to take a look at the inside of the piece uh, so that we can see sort of the rustic interior here. Let's take a look at these panels, how they're beveled around the edges, roughly asymmetrically. There are clear hand saw marks all over it. And this is typical. We see the width of the structural boards up there, cheaper furniture made much later, or much closer to present day, will have tiny little boards. Um, but anyway, we just see that there's a certain rusticity, an unfinished aspect to the more functional parts of a period piece, due to the fact that back in 1690, it was really uh, a pain to make this piece look so wonderful on the outside, they did not go to the same trouble to achieve that same level of refinement inside. And so, as we close the door, let us just briefly take a look, as if I could just cram the key right back in there, this is what makes me think maybe this key is not the original key. It's, you leave it in, we, we leave the key in the lock. We do not take it out ever. And then we have another typical emblem here of 17th century furniture, these quadra lobes. They have lobes. There are four of them, quadra lobe. Pretty, pretty intense art history going on here with, with the terms, but 
There you have it. And then the rest of the piece is sculpted with sort of scrolling foliage motifs, which would have been inspired by the ornamental manuals of the day, like the one by um, Jean Berin. And so these Parisian ornamentalists would elaborate these ornamental designs and put them in a book, and then those would be published and diffused throughout the countryside and used by furniture makers all over France to ornament their pieces. <laughs> Then we appear to have the royal magpie here, la pie royale, lovely. And uh, anyway, a little, little bit of 17th century hinge action going on as usual. The hinges are a little bit loose, perhaps because this is 300 years old and you know they're stuck in the wood and the doors have been opened 750,000 times. So yeah, the hinges are a little loose. Uh, sometimes you have to do the toothpick trick where you take a toothpick and you hammer it in there and you kind of tighten them up and you know, I don't know if that's French Ministry of Culture's furniture reserve protocol there to do the toothpick trick, but I've heard that it's been done before and you might uh, have some luck. As usual, I thank you very much for watching. And if you've enjoyed this content, if it's been useful for you to take a closer look, please subscribe to the channel as it would greatly help in the development of this online period furniture library of the most compelling pieces that I encounter, and it would also help us wage war against people who would like to conflate works of decorative art like this with any old antique.